Good afternoon, front row. We're still getting settled in back here. Roger, Hans. Afternoon. And for folks ashore, welcome to the afternoon watch. Oh, it's a beautiful polyopagon. <laughs> well, I chatted with Val and I had the update from her and then, uh, like you've probably heard as well, we're between waypoint five and six. Moving up the ridge, there are 11 waypoints in this transit. Uh, the dive, uh, we all do want to get to the caldera, what could be a caldera at the end, at the summit, but we're making good time. She just took a rock sample not too long ago, the suggestion is maybe we get near to 1,600 meters and we get another sample. But if we see a good spot with you know, the dark angular uh, samples, we can make that call. And um, we're not taking any Niskins. And she's been hitting the waypoints pretty close. But of course, you know, we just kind of follow our noses up the ridge as you have been doing. And that's uh, that's the update I've had from her. All right. Thanks, Hans. Also, someone's having a special occasion on this watch. But <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that for later. Uh, front row, are we good for um, just a little recap and introductions? I'm good, but I'll defer to the rest of the front row. I'm Dan. I'm sitting in the Hercules chair. <laughs> so I guess we're good. I have good on my right, and on my left I have... That was a joke. Uh, <laughs> I can't really... Can you move uh, your microphone uh, a little closer? <laughs> he was making a joke because I said I'm good. So <laughs> I'm good. Also, I'm Mia. I'm serving as the navigator. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. Oh. Our viewer had a special request. Can we um, introduce the person next to us? So do you want to introduce the person to your no, left? No, no, no. <laughs> we're not playing that game. Sorry. Get on with it. <laughs> okay. If we have um, some operational things, then we can make sure we, do. we, get yeah. we can speed through it. Go ahead. Uh, okay. I'm Mia. Again, opted interrupted. I'm the navigator. And when I'm not serving as a navigator, I'm working on mapping. Hand it over to Jake. Hello, Kako. My name is Jake, and I am in the Atalanta chair. I'm stoked to be here in the monument. Aloha. My name is Jaina. I am the video engineer on this watch, and I'm from Hila, Hawaii. And we'll bring it back around to the back. Okay, Ali, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elsa, and I'm a supporting scientist here on this watch. And while not on Nautilus, I'm a researcher at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. And I'll pass it on to Kara. Great, thanks. Um, hi, everyone, and half a day to our uh, viewer tuning in from Guam. Uh, my name is Kara. I serve as the Science Communication Fellow uh, for this watch, and um, uh, when I'm not here, I work as the Seagrass and Mangrove Conservation Coordinator at the Guam Coral Reef Initiative, although I grew up in New York um, in the salt marshes of Long Island. So I'll pass that on to Hans. Hello, thanks for tuning in. My name is Hans Van Tilburg. I'm a NOAA Maritime Archaeologist, historian for our Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and I'm sitting in the watch lead chair. I'll be pushing the button on the still camera, and I'm struggling to deal with the fact that um, we need to refer to ships as it mm -hmm. and not she but that's an interesting discussion oh. for another time yeah. 
Upashana. Thank you. Uh, I'm Upashana Ganguly. I study the evolution of deep sea octocorals and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette and the biologist for this lead. And Taylor Ann. Hello, I'm Taylor Ann. I am the data logger on this watch and science manager. So I'll be logging all observations that we see today. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks for everything you do to make ocean exploration work on our watch. Um, and you might have heard one of our um, team members introduce themselves, Jacob, the Jacob Wessling. Um, today is Jake's birthday, so we would like to just give out a shout out to Jake. Um, happy birthday, woo, -woo from Hello. all of us <laughs> in your team. Happy birthday, Jake. Happy birthday. Thank you. And just to recap, um, Hans mentioned earlier, we're heading towards a uh, caldera. So we currently are on an unnamed seamount as part of the Ala Almoana Kayuli expedition. Uh, we're located about 45 nautical miles southeast. We're good of to uh, do any zooms if you want. Just uh, circle what you want to see. Okay, great. Thank you. Of Pearl and Hermes Atoll. And this seamount was mapped for the first time in 2014 by RV Falcor. Uh, the summit is at a depth of about 1,250 meters uh, with that caldera on top. So we are going to be um, kind of moving up this ridge towards that caldera, and then we'll take some time to explore that um, summit as well. And as we go along, we'll be con uh, collecting some biological and geological samples. Feel free to um, let us know if you have any questions in our chat box, and we'll try to get to them when we can. Thanks, everyone, for exploring with us. We were watching some of those samples be cut apart on deck yesterday, some of the geological samples. So one of the ways that, that Val and Hannah process the, the rocks is to um, slice them open with a tile saw and look at what they can tell of the minerals inside, the, the state of the rock. My understanding is some are weathered and altered to, agree, to a degree where it's not as useful for the processes they're using to date them, but some are looking more um, you know, original in form and have, have a lot of use for them to use the dating methods they apply and understand the, the age of these seamounts, which tells a part of where these seamounts may be from. Because ultimately they're looking at the movement of tectonic plates in the basin of the entire Pacific Ocean and kind of reading the story, the history of the Pacific Ocean on a scale of 100 million years or so. So it's really fascinating what they're doing. And there will always be a number of us on the back deck watching Val and others cut into those rocks to see what they may hold inside. Yeah, for sure. I definitely learned so much um, looking at, I believe they were referring to them as like vesicles inside the rock. I don't really know the terminology. And then the manganese crust. Um, so it's kind of cool, kind of like how you learn about anatomy of biological organisms, but looking at the different um, parts you can observe of the rock. And um, I believe uh, we note it on our uh, whiteboard as rock o'clock so hopefully we can share that on <laughs> rock o'clock yeah hopefully we can share some more rock o'clocks on uh, social media to also share those pictures of what those rocks look like inside and um, Val can also explain a little bit more about what we're looking at yeah they're pretty good at that yeah and Val if you're ever down in the lounge and you want to chime in like feel free to um, share any of your knowledge we would love to we would love to hear it 
I always miss rock o'clock. Oh no, because... Sleep schedule. Ah, uh, yeah. So far it's been like kind of in the mid-morning. Well, I have some videos. Uh, if you want to check them out, I can show you. I can't fully explain uh, what's going on, but yeah. Yeah, so that looks like Wait, a bam. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I don't know if it's a scrap of net or not, but bamboo coral, yeah? Yeah, the skeleton is of, it's a dead, uh, it's from a dead bamboo coral. Uh, we see an ophiroid. Uh, this kind of looks like something that got stuck in the skeleton, but uh, yeah, and uh, I think on the right we have a paragorgia, but if we can have a look at what is stuck. And there are a bunch of hydroids growing on top of the uh, dead skeleton. This looks like some piece of a coral skeleton or something. I'm seeing knots. Yeah, I can Go see ahead, some squares. Yeah. It's looking like a piece of net that's drifted in and... Yes. If that's yes, 10 centimeters, a then... Um, Oh, a number you know, of them are falling down. Yeah. That mesh looks like maybe six or eight centimeters. I'm just guessing. And that's maybe the only diagnostic thing we can tell about these pieces of net, trawl net or whatever it was, is the mesh size, which does give us some information. And it's less than 10. Maybe more than five, six centimeters. Thank you. Right. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but drift nets and fishing debris, you know, is is an issue in the Pacific. And because we see this fragment here, doesn't mean that nets or trawl nets were used here, but it could have drifted in, drifted in from pretty far away. And there has been an ongoing program of marine debris removal in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands within the monument, and those are found, you know, cast ashore onto the shallow reefs near the atolls, and so. Um, divers will, you know, go up there for extended periods on charter vessels and remove a lot of that net. And there are tons and tons of that net that are removed regularly from the atolls and brought back to Hawaii. Or actually a lot of it goes to our H power plant and is burned for energy. Wow, it's kind of crazy to know that's the end of the life cycle for that particular net. Um, and I think NOAA as a whole, um, the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has a whole marine debris program. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn more, they, they have marine debris projects all over uh, the country and they also have funding opportunities. So if you have ideas for tackling marine debris um, in your community, wherever you are, um, they can help fund like I believe in the past uh, maybe like tour operators have helped r remove marine debris and um, different community groups have gone in some funding and actually the international coastal cleanup was just uh, last weekend I think so yeah definitely a lot of opportunities to get involved if that's something you you want to make a difference in
right yeah. here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we have been seeing lots of eridogorges, uh, some hemichoralliums. There's something yellowish towards the south or towards the bottom of the screen as well that, uh, if possible, Yeah, so it's one of the uh, <coughs> bamboo coral uh, colonies that we have been seeing, uh, that we saw, I think, on the last seamount as well. And I think they have been seeing this before as well on this, uh, on the previous watches. Uh, this is the one with the more rounded branches. That's how they, have, they uh, Dr. Franz has been calling them in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for the Zoom. Uh, there was a yellower colony before. If we can have a look at that, that would be great as well. Where was the yellow colony? Yeah, I'll, I'll point it out. Oh, okay. It's not in view right now. When they had... And also, what is this bushy thing over here? That's also <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be here for a while, all right? Uh, uh, that, there's the yellow. So this one yeah, and right. this one. Yeah, That's right. all. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Cool. Okay, it's good. There's something soft and pink down there. Yeah. The yellow. Yeah. Is it always soft if it's pink? I was going to say, actually, I don't know if it's soft, but it looks like one of those soft, squishy things we've been seeing. So, Mushroom? Probably. It's the same one I trip over every morning. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, can we look a little bit more close, uh, a little bit more zoom on the yellow? That is my full zoom right now. Oh, okay. Uh, I okay. can stand back and get a little closer. Go, okay. on, go ahead for me, please. Thank you. The previous watch saw a sp uh, sea spider. Really? Yeah. Have we seen a sea spider no, on our haven't. watch yet? No. Oh. And I really like sea spiders. Yeah, I've seen them in the photo captures, and I was like, whoa. I hope we really get to see some. They were pretty cool, like orange and really thin looking. And of course, we're going to vessel bounce right then. Telegraph to the ROV. A little western with it here. Is the darker one what is the Rodano gold here? Okay, try that. 
Yeah, apparently Rodanogorgia and Iridogorgia doesn't have genetic differences, even though they are different. Do you is anybody Looking saying left on uh, for anything me. in the crowd? Have a look at the tether there, make sure it's... Yeah, it looks like what was previously, I would have called a plexorid, but now would be a paramarciate. Uh, uh, sorry, my chat, I can't use the chat properly right okay. now, but does anybody think that, uh, can this be an acanthogorgia of some kind? It can be a paramarciate. Yeah. Okay, good. So, Asako confirms that it is not an acanthogorgia. It's most likely a, a, some kind of a paramarciate. Okay, Thank you. Keep going. Uh, I can come up a little more. I'll move it here. Hate it when I press the wrong button. Okay, Jenny, you can push in there if you want, please. The bushy thing. Yeah, bushy thing with things inside. Things inside, yeah, so indeed. Definitely a chrysogorgia with shrimps and squat lobsters. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. And I. It might not be apparent on the main screen, but for folks tuning in, the, the winds come up, the sea's livelier, we're feeling more motion in the van, and I guess that would translate to more motion on the tow sled on Atalanta, wouldn't it? Yeah. We actually had a viewer comment recently. They could see it in the graph of like how Atalanta was moving. So that was pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, good observation. One of the things we watch is uh, how far Atalanta's going up and down, and that also affects um, it tends to uh, porpoise or nosedive a bit. which affects our, uh, you know, it's telegraphed to her. You don't notice it till you're doing the close-up stuff. Mm -hmm. Those are very fluffy, really gorgeous. Yeah, it's really pretty. They're extra, sp like the spirals are extra tight. Did I get that right? Yes, it is an iridogorgia. <laughs> Every time I think I know something, I know nothing. <laughs> Sorry, I was in the back trying to go through the previous chats uh, for some coral that I'm supposed to find. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, this one on the right also uh, looks like the more brambly, uh, I think Jason Isis bamboo corals that we have been seeing. Some beautiful large Urtogorgias and a small Chrysogorgia. And our friends in the background, polyopagon. Yes. <laughs> yes. I just can't get enough of saying that word. Yeah. It's such a fun <laughs> word. I'm going to turn left here. I'm going to whap in the tether. <laughs> And we have a viewer just commenting, thank you for teaching us so many of the Latin names that just um, you just let go at the tip of your tongue um, during the previous dozen or so watches. I can almost tell the difference between a hemichorallium and a branched bamboo coral at a distance. So thanks, Supashana, for um, giving a little, uh, I guess, course on uh, coral ID over the past <laughs> several watches. 
Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you I so think this will be re reflected in the instructor evaluation sheet. <laughs> Yeah, that's a beautiful polyopogon sponge. It's a, another massive one. Mm -hmm. and we have Iritogorgias surrounding it. There's a small bamboo whip. Let's move uh, two zero north, please. That's another polyopogon with a squat lobster or two squat lobsters. And the common name for this is elephant ear sponge, right? Yeah. Okay. Although they definitely don't all look like elephant ears. That's true. Now there's a small one. <laughs> oh, cute. <laughs> 814. Yeah. That's like the smallest one we've seen so far of yeah. the, these elephant ear sponges. Okay, I am. What about that very translucent one off to the left or the right? right. Yeah, that's that's a dead world area. That's a nice collection of yes. uh, diversity. We see different kinds of chrysogorgids. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but the irregular iridogorgia is this one here. Yeah, it has more of a straight stem down low. Was it curly all the way to the base, like yeah. the cousin its? Rhona iridogorgia? Rhona yeah. yeah. So yeah, that is the one. Like that apparently doesn't have any genetic difference with the retogorgias, but it's a different genus. you want a close shot of the yellow one there? Or can you tell what it is? I think it's the same paramarsia that we, paramarsia that we saw. Uh, yeah, I think we can continue. And we have a nice bamboo whip. Sorry, can't quite hear you. Oh, sorry. No, I said that uh, I think it is the same uh, paramarsiid that we saw previously, so we can continue. Rodan. Rodan into the Gorgia. That's the. Rotan is the bridge.
Okay, there's another one at uh, 8.45, which would be a bamboo cord. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be one C pen at 8.14 and 8.45, 8.43 bamboo cord. Okay, timestamp is 1045 HST or 2045 here. Uh, and the rock band would be I think there, I see it. I see it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. And the bamboo core, the 845, 2045. Yeah. That's fine. Sorry. I don't know how that works. I'm just going to keep it. Is there a way to save or mark things? Can you guys like highlight a particular annotation? Like pin it or Can we get two zero north, please? We had a comment about the names of sponges and um, the interesting name of elephant ear sponges. So definitely there's a lot of sponge diversity. Um, within the deep sea, there's also glass sponges, um, given their intricate texture. And then if you um, want to check out some other sponges, Uh, NOAA's Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary has some um, images and uh, scientific and common names of different sponges. So uh, feel free to check that out. They have an orange elephant ear sponge, and these are shallow, shallower water sponges. Um, purple branching tube sponges, um, sulfur sponge, brown volcano carpet sponge, Ethereal heavenly sponge, brown encrusting octopus sponge, stinker sponge. Um, so, and of course, giant giant barrel sponges. So, um, it's pretty amazing. Feel free to look at um, their web page again. That's Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary.
You did, thank you. And we had a question previously we about following the ridge line. Um, natural products, and just wanted to share this story that um, a breakthrough AIDS treatment was actually found uh, from a sponge. So a scientist was able to look at a sponge, and this is shallow water, but look at a sponge from the Florida Keys, and they were able to uh, figure out more of its um, structure of the, this particular compound and then test it and um, they found that it was able to uh, treat herpes, shingles, and the World Health Organization lists it as essential medicine. So it's pretty amazing what we can... Um, uh, come down five for me. Oh. That's a beautiful sea anemone that we are seeing. Uh, again, a nice bushy chrysogorgia. We have mm. an isogorgia in the back and uh, one uh, rhodaniridogorgia to the l right, to the left of the chrysogorgia. And a beautiful Feel big it. sea anemone. Sorry, I was Feeling just trying to... a little to for the first time. Oh, yeah, that's, that's such spoiled. a beautiful scene we're yeah. looking at. I love that color. It is very beautiful. I was just going through the chat to uh, consolidate some information yeah, yeah. That because my advisor What's was on. Yeah. That's like normal. Usually that thing's going up and down four meters. Uh, zoom in there for me, please. You can uh, call in a move. 20045, please. That is a beautiful sea anemone. Do we know which one, that, which kind this is, or uh, sea anemone it is? Yeah. Uh, I will try to look it up. Uh, I mean no pressure, just an wondering. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely an acting area, uh, but I'm not sure what kind. Uh, yes. And so in the center, that's its mouth, right? Yes. Yeah. And then when it catches things on the tentacles, how exactly does that get to the center? Are there like little cilia hairs? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. They have like minute structures and the tentacles also move and direct the water towards the mouth. Mm. And that's okay, how they go feed. Ahead, thanks. Very cool. Um, I think a viewer was asking if you had What's mentioned up? No, I'm going to drop down on the promenade here. A sea avocado before? Is that something you were talking about? They were curious if you had seen it since you talked about it? So, um, sea avocado is a name that uh, Val gave it. Oh. So it was basically an unknown organism uh, that kind of looks like a big sack. Uh, kind of like a tunicate, but not really a tunicate, so nobody exactly knew what it was. Uh, something like this was previously seen in the, in the Pacific Oceans as well, because we have a reference image in the Benthic Animal Guide as well, but it, this one was a dark purple in color. So we don't have a confirmed ID on it, but C. avocado is just a name that Val came up with to describe what wow. it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I get, is that what's on your screen right now? Yeah, It yeah. does look kind yeah. of an avocado shape. So that was a nice name. Very cool. And uh, yeah, we have uh, a 
Massive right polio up. program sponsor again here, so I'm road and to go here. Uh, and looks like something like an Anil to go here, or road to go here. That if we can have a zoom on will be great. Uh, go ahead, can I push in there a bit for us. Yeah, I think it is. Come on. Uh, yeah, I think it is a Rodanero to Gorgia. They can be a bit bushy as well. Um, and there are several uh, species in it. Thank you so much. All right. Sorry Thank about you. that. Was no, yeah, I there. haven't seen a lot of Rodanero to Gorgia before, so it takes me a while to ID them and confirm that it's the genus. So is the difference between that and the Aridogorgia is it has the um, all the way down its body, not just at the top? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. A bit of a stiff oh, breeze that's a there. Fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I think the color is slightly different, and like you it. said, the spiral goes along the length, and sometimes they can be branched as well. Uh, but uh, like I was uh, mentioning before, I learned it from going back into the chat <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> So in my lab, previously, there was a former grad student, a former PhD student, uh, who had... Yeah, that's from zinging. I can't get around. Oh, here. okay, wait, wait, wait. Try full power. Maybe if I come down more. Oh, yes, so the bushy the, uh, one uh, was not one of the bushier uh, Rodan Iridogorgia. It was Iridogorgia splendens. Thank you, uh, Asako, so much for that. Uh, yes. So this is a can't do it. This is a species of Iridogorgia that looks like the, the do species Iridogorgia splendens that kind of is bushy and yeah, uh, yeah it kind of is not uh, growing li linearly tall. Uh, yeah, I hadn't seen this before. Thank you so much. But those ones which have the uh, spirals and the branches along the length, and there are some here which are branches as well. So yes, the two spirally genera, the Rhodanitogorgia and the Rhodanitogorgia. And apparently, so according to uh, uh, the work of this former PhD student, Eric Ponte in our lab, uh, he had found using the mitochondrial gene markers that there is no genetic difference. I mean, there is difference, but they are they form in the same clade, so be, they can be the same genus based on the mitochondrial uh, data that he, they had generated. So even though they they are uh, classified as two different genera. Maybe I just made it sound really confusing, but... <laughs> no, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just amazed at the polio pogon sponges that we are seeing on the sea mount as well. And the, I think the only difference would be that we are seeing uh, slightly smaller sized polio pogons here too, in addition to the very large massive sponges. And we had a comment that um, these scenes are so beautiful and deserve to be freeze-framed in photography and painted. <laughs> so um, Hans is actually at the still camera. Um, he's got the still camera up, so um, different people have been taking photos on our different watches, and we will be sharing some of those. So definitely keep an eye out if you want to use those for inspiration for any paintings. And on our Instagram, we... Um, posted some of our most favorite uh, beautiful scenes from one of our dives recently that was just absolutely full of pink, yellow, and orange corals. So if you want to check that out, um, head over to our Instagram page.
push in there a bit. That's good. I think it gives you a uh, background idea of the current. It's just really ripping up over that cliff there. Yeah. Using Herc's full power, I cannot um, get out over the cliff and turn around. I can't even like get out over the cliff sideways. So if I went out over it and tried to turn around, it would slam me back into the into the wall probably. <laughs> at least at that one particular spot. A lot of times, if we like get below the ridge line, we can come around. But. Yeah, Oriel was saying the same thing that the swell is pretty strong and that we can test the moves but we you know it might not work out oh uh, yeah that's but i mean it's look this is pretty with it dancing around and <laughs> <In> the current <laughs> yeah it's a beautiful thing to Hans, if you're trying to talk. Okay. Well, or, yeah, I understand we try to get to the caldera. We'll get there. We just might not get around on the side that we planned on the dive. We might come up the, uh, the west side a bit. So if the current's ripping like this, yeah, if we keep going <coughs> northeast, um, it's anybody's guess how the currents work around these. But... Um, if the current maintains its direction here, going um, uh, to the west, it's really hard. So as we go northwest, we'll eventually go, you know, then we can go, or sorry, northeast, which we're doing now, east by northeast, actually. Um, then we can come up the, uh, the west side of the caldera. Okay, let's keep it moving. Another move, uh, zero six zero, please. You want to let's ca call that ship moving because I want to keep it moving in the current. So every time we stop, swing in, stop, swing in, it's more dramatic because we're working in the current. <coughs> make way better time if we can keep Atlanta moving the whole time and with the current there will be um, more of a pronounced uh, offset so when we stop it's gonna it's gonna take longer to start and stop so if we, if we want to make time towards the caldera we keep keep it moving And just a shout out to Else, supporting scientist, who's in the data logger chair again. Um, 
recording all our observations. After learning, taking a crash course in deep sea coral taxonomy, so awesome job. Also a very competent, able body sea person. See her slinging the ropes around there on the back deck. Yeah, Elsa just is like doing it all, tying ropes on the back deck, entering data, processing samples, doing classroom calls. Let's call the next one in uh, zero nine zero. I can't believe how these guys are moving around. If the current's strong here, do you want us to pause the chat for a bit while we no, maneuver, or are we good? you're fine. Okay. If it gets too much, I just... Uh, yeah, so that is a metallogorgia. The yellows would be bamboo coral fans, probably Jason Isis. Uh, and we have... So these are juvenile metallogorgias because you can still see the uh, branches below, like along the stalk. And some bamboo coral whips. We have some nice iridogorgias in the background. Zoom in there for a second, please. That's good. It looks like the sakura blossom tree. <laughs> so pretty. Yeah. It has the characteristics of your creus uh, oedipus in it. Okay, let's see if we can make some headway here. Thank you. Now this is definitely a challenging transect on this dive. Yeah. You know, not only is there strong current on the bottom flowing over this ridge, but the sea state is up and the ship at the surface which controls the movements of Atalanta is, you know, being moved by its thrusters, maintaining station, but also, I'd imagine, keeping its head into the swells. Right. And so there are considerations there for its heading and what it can do. Um, yeah, I'm always surprised and, and impressed at the amount of choreography that goes into yeah, these dives. Yeah, for sure. And I think the, the ship's um, dynamic positioning Roger. system is probably working a little extra hard to keep us in place today because of the swell, right? Ooh, fish? Yeah, that was another of the one of the halosaurid days, the halosaurid fishes. Ridge running. Uh, Cliff to the left, and if we can get over there, cliff to the right. Let's see if we uh, drop down on the other side and see what it looks like. The leeward side.
This feels more like those first days on our expedition <laughs> when we yeah. had just left the, the harbor. Yeah. yeah, I took some seasickness medication. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a little bumpy since morning. So, interestingly enough, I learned something from the chat. So, remember the neon green uh, sponges that we have been uh, seeing mm -hmm. in some of the other sea mounds? So, this would be another Rodani Rido Borgia, the one that we are seeing. So, uh, and apparently the previous watch or the one before that, they saw one of those um, neon green sponges again that that uh, we were uh, jokingly calling the Jetsons chairs. Yeah, yeah. Yes, those. And uh, so we were calling them the Bolosoma species because that's what the ID was. It was a euplectolid. It is in the fa in the subfamily uh, Bolosominae, correct? But uh, the ID hasn't been updated in a while. So the ID was calling it a Bolosoma species. So we have been calling it that. But it has a different genus name because it was uh, a while ago uh, identified. Uh, it was uh, it was identified and put into a new genus and a new family. So the correct ID for this neon green uh, sponges and before they came up with the genus, they were called Bolosoma species. So the new ID would be the Advena uh, magnifica. So we have been right. calling them the Polosoma. The correct ID is Advena Magnifica for the Magnifica, neon. Magnifica, yeah. what a great name. Exactly. <laughs> and it has a story. Wait, I will tell you why the genus name. Oh, yes. I'd love to hear the sponge story. <laughs> it's very, very sparse on the, um, the northwest side, very dense on the southeast side. Okay. And I can't get over that. Uh, I'm going to read noise. out two small passages from the yeah, sure. news which had the article which had it. The scientific name for a new animal is always Latin or Greek. Uh, we usually let's try to make that one, sorry. associate the zero six zero to something unique about the species or we can honor someone, the expedition name or a locality. In this case, in the case of Advena Magnifica, the shape of the sponge is reminiscent of an alien, like in the movies, uh, keep us on the ridge <laughs> which, uh, with what uh, looks like a long, thin neck, an elongated head, tail and huge tail. eyes. <laughs> Advena is from the Latin advena, which means alien, but in the sense of visitor, foreigner, or immigrant. Of course, we humans were the actual visitors to the sponge's deep sea home when we found this magnificent alien. While we haven't officially given it a common name in our paper, E.T. Sponge seems to altitude. be uh, the right fit. Zoom in there, please. That's yeah. a really cute sea star. It is. I've it had SPL off uh, working with NAV, but yeah, it's so cute. Kind of has the colors of a banana. <laughs> <laughs> like the inside, oh, yeah. Pulling me, pulling me. Okay, I'm coming up. Go away, please. Oh, you're going to have to come up. Sorry, I got too far away there. Uh, it just looks worse than it is if you watch your... Um, if you watch yeah, if you watch the actual depth, um, the altitude looks wonky because it's, if you look at the um, pitch, it's pitching like, you know, 10, 15 degrees. So, and uh, since it's this irregular old altimeter, it, um, we don't get the wide, you know, DVL spread. It's another one of the two headed sponges in the distance. Yes, one of those uh, color figures. Color figures. Yeah, those elements. Is it only the color figures that we see the two, the multiple heads, or just that's a type of morphology I seen in know, other so sorry, genus as well? So, for this particular kind of a uh, sponge with two rounded I don't know like yet. heads. <coughs> sorry, Dan. What do you think we should do? So this, uh, uh, so far I have seen just in Colophagus and there are lots of species in the particular genus.
Right. Yep, that's good. 065 is fine. Okay, can zoom in there. Look at it strumming in the breeze. <laughs> yeah. Are all its polyps closed? Uh, they're retracted, yeah. So that's a beautiful bamboo coral uh, fan again uh, with internodal branching. So. <sighs> and. I think uh, internodal. So I think that is echnomyces. Yes. This would be an echnomyces. Thank you so much. Right here. Okay, you can go away next. Yeah, apparently my advisor, Dr. Scott Franz, he has been active uh, and watching the uh, videos since uh, our early morning, so most of Friday back in Lafayette. And it's now when I am on watch, he decides not to be active and not to be watching the videos. And now I have to try and ID all the right. bamboo corals when he is the bamboo coral person and would have been really helpful to have him in the chart. Thank you. Uh, for next move will be zero four five, please. Thank you for the viewers that are sharing their stories right. of what you've learned from uh, this watch and previous watches. We always love being on this exploration and learning journey with you. And um, thank you also for the comment about um, asking um, about how to get into this field, especially if that's not what you're currently doing. Um, do you have any, does anyone want to share about uh, uh, any time they've made like a major career change from one field to another? They were just curious about that. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think uh, this field is a very general term because it is a huge multidisciplinary field. Yeah. And, uh, so we need and we have people from every aspect of uh, research and academia and from every aspect it is possible to be involved. So I think it is very uh, subjective to what part or what aspect of marine research or they want, they are interested in, but I'm sure like we all have uh, stories and experiences of moving from one field to another and I think we can we can start by sharing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Was that a nod at me or? Uh, no, I'm still like, I, I, oh. mean, I can go later. Like, I oh. think, yeah. Because oh. mine is a little different because I come from a different country and the systems and everything is a little different. So, uh, Well, I guess I can kind of go. Um, <laughs> I actually grew up in Chicago, the south suburbs of Chicago, and didn't visit the ocean until I was an adult. Um, I really? grew up next to Lake Michigan, but my first time seeing the ocean was when I was 18 years old. I was really blessed to be able to go to Costa Rica for a Spanish for honors class trip. Um, Ooh, that's yeah, exciting. <laughs> it, it was great. Um, but I've always had a love for water and nature but I didn't know that being a biologist or a marine biologist was even a career. So 
when I went to college, I flip-flopped from being a vet to telecommunications major, and then finally found my way to biology. Um, but I went to college yeah. in uh, Indiana, which was a landlocked state, so they didn't have marine biology. Um, so I, it took me a while to kind of figure out what I wanted to do, but basically I just was soul searching and watched a lot of documentaries and finally saw Mission Blue, which was a documentary on Netflix that really, really inspired me um, in a sad way. It was very sad to see how the ocean was hurting. Mm -hmm. um, hold on, just want to pause and check yeah. with the pilots here. Are we good? I don't want to talk. Yeah, all good. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so that documentary really inspired me, seeing Sylvia Earle being a woman to really pioneer um, and break glass ceilings in ocean sciences and have a huge heart to try to protect the ocean. Um, I just realized that that was something I also wanted to do, right. um, but I wasn't sure how to figure that out. So I switched and to I just a general another, biology uh, degree. Zero, four, five. And I kept That's applying for tons and tons of internships in marine science, but it was really, really hard. Yeah. Um, I oftentimes got told no um, because I didn't have enough experience in marine science. Mm -hmm. um, and the times that I did get told yes, the experiences were too expensive or too far away and right. didn't offer any support. And I come from a single family home, just or a single mother, um, who raised me and my sister, and she didn't go to college. And I don't even know if my father finished high school, so. Uh, it was really, really hard to bridge that gap, but I kept applying even after being told no and eventually got a yes. <laughs> um, so don't get discouraged if, you know, you try to break into this field right. and you get told no and get pushed out. That happened to me right. too. And yeah. um, honestly, those no's are what led me to a better, a better yes, <laughs> right, better right. than I could have even imagined. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I finally got an internship opportunity um, at Duke University which was way, way, way cooler than anything else I had applied wow, for and got told no awesome. for <laughs> in yeah. the past. So yeah, don't give up. Uh, just lean on your community. And um, I think, yeah, your family and the people that are around you that you know can support you and push you forward in your passion, I think that's what really helped me is that I kept leading with my heart even if I <laughs> was told no. Oh, um, I love yeah. that. So I think that's okay to be told no. Yeah, and, and similarly, I also, um, applied for an internship at Duke for one year and then um, didn't get it and I didn't get any internships that year and then I applied again the next year and got some Negative. bonuses. So yeah, you can see it's really just keep trying Animals and strumming trying in the breeze. And we both ended up here, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah. so funny, right? <laughs> um, and then another thing I wanted to share because... Yeah, we're getting, we're making it east, north, east. Eat there, bless. <laughs> east, north, east. Sorry, Taylor. <laughs> No, uh, it's Hans okay. jumped in there. I didn't realize I was running over you. That's okay. Great story. Um, just adding on to that a little bit, because um, our viewer pointed out age. So um, actually, uh, one mm -hmm. of my uh, best friends, their mom was a stay-at-home mom taking care of uh, four children. And then once, um, I guess they were in a a little bit older, she went back to school, uh, got her PhD in biology, and now she is like doing amazing stuff with biomedical technology. Wow, um, that's so, so cool. Yeah, so I know our viewer was expressing like, is it age a factor? I think really like any at any point, um, basically for her, she went back and uh, I think audited, so like viewed some courses in biology for a little bit, um, just to get updated in the field after you know, having been away from school, taking care and raising her kids for a while. Um, and then she uh, applied for that graduate program and got her PhD. And now, yeah, now she's running things. So um, yeah. definitely don't don't feel like that change is impossible. But I know it's a little scary, too. I, when I was in school, like um, marine science almost felt like like becoming a marine biologist almost felt similar to people who are aspiring to be musicians or like you know, artists a little bit, like, oh, the pay might not be great, or like, you know, it's really competitive. Um, so, so I kind of had like a backup, like if I Roger, don't, uh, 20, zero, six, zero, please. if I'm not able to make it, then I can still right. be like a biology teacher or, you know, a lab technician or something like that. So knowing those uh, different options can be helpful as well. Yeah, and I think that was something I really struggled with because I didn't know what options were out right. there. I 
Yeah, I always knew I wanted to be an explorer, but I didn't know you could do that for a right. career. And yeah. I've never dreamed of labor. I've always dreamed of protection and conservation. And those things are just passions rather than a, a labor. Um, yeah, so I think it can be really challenging if you're not exposed to new environments. And also, if you don't see anyone looking like you that's right. doing those things, if everyone looks different than you, you, you kind of get that narrative or belief that you can't do it or that you don't belong there, which is not true. Um, but it's something that's, you know, very hard growing up as a kid. Yeah, for um, sure. But yeah, I'm thankful to, you know, now be representation for other people that look like me. And uh, I hope that, you know, that really encourages people to keep trying and pushing forward, even if the systems that are in place aren't favorable for us. Yeah. And I think slowly more and more, there's like more opportunities for youth, more that are funded. So, you know, you don't have to self-fund yourself while doing internships. Um, so really, there's a, a TNC, the Nature Conservancy, puts out a, um, at least recently, they've been doing an externship, which makes it accessible for anybody in the world, any youth in the world that are interested in doing a community-based project. And you can kind of just propose that project and they'll fund it. So um, pretty amazing strides we're making in supporting uh, education all around the world for people, especially from disadvantaged um, socioeconomic backgrounds. Yeah, there's hope out there for sure. Yeah. Things are changing and I think that's great. <laughs> hope dies last. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> hope dies last. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think, sorry, before we... No, please, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think that would be a small... Can we have a quick zoom on this one if possible? Right here. Uh, that looks like a calyptrophora or a paracalyptrophora or can be the pleurogorgia Okay, can push in there. Gorgia as well. They are waving in the breeze. Uh, I don't, uh, sorry, this I don't know the bearing of the current. I was talking about uh, that. Uh, I got confused. What, do you, what would you say? It's coming uh, up it's over that ridge. Like so it's like an gorgia. It's just blowing a lot. Then it's, uh, then it's a pleurogorgia. Oh, a pleurogorgia. It's a white ones. Oh, okay. The more planar, whiter ones that we were seeing. Because, or is, are you saying that it's an area to go it's just because of the current it's looking like that? I, that's what I'm thinking okay. at this moment. Okay. But it, it can does be look more white, so. But also I can see the spiral now. So yeah, I think you're right. It is an area to go Thank you so much. Thanks for right. nice view of the shrimp. Okay, you can go white. Yeah, very beautiful color. Very beautiful. Yeah, it is. Yeah, now I see it. And beside it, we have a beautiful reddish gorge, but it is slightly whiter. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's yeah, it did have a different color, color for sure. Yeah. And there's a nice polypogat sponge at the end. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted the very interesting discussion that was going on. No, not at all. Please, like, feel free to jump in and be like, that's a whatever <laughs> sponge, or like, we need to make that observation, or yeah, that's why zoom we're in. <laughs> yeah. And also to add to that conversation, uh, I can say more from the biological, right the biological right. side, uh, or the, I can't say so much for the technical again, and the engineering side, but general research kind of side. Right, um, I'm just going to drop down. Depending uh, on what uh, stage of uh, academia or what stage somebody is, uh, sometimes like having a certain uh, formal academic degree helps uh, it, it doesn't have to be in main biology it doesn't have to be in main science but I'm just using biology as an example it is true for physical oceanography so in in oceanography or in marine science besides the technical and the engineering uh -huh. uh, there are four different uh, aspects the physical oceanography chemical oceanography geological oceanography and biological oceanography and we're using biological oceanography I mean in biology as an example here and there are other aspects as well broadly uh, having a degree in biology in zoology helps if some or having some if not uh, a specialized degree uh, somebody, if, if suppose you are, I'm in a place where I don't have access to a main science program or a main right. biology program, then uh, somebody should go for whatever is the closest or the broader umbrella. It's right, like, like just environmental science. Environmental you know, science, yeah. general biology, that helps. And then 
trying to get involved in work uh, if you're uh, somebody's in a college. No, you don't have the altitude. You're right up. You're just project. coming over the end there and just drop down into a little... Uh, uh, in the university, that doesn't have to be related to what you eventually want to, to do, but having an experience the corner, in, uh, in uh, working in a lab, uh, having hands-on experience Check doing little out. research projects that go I a long way. That. Because... Uh, the way research is done and formal academia is very different. Uh, so having that experience matters. Yeah. And uh, because it, we also need to understand if we enjoy doing that, because our, our research is a, involves doing the same thing over and over again. Right. It is a lot of troubleshooting. It is a lot of doing uh, repetitive experiments. So those experiences from an early stage helps train ourselves for the field and also uh, learn about how research works and then going for projects which are more uh, closely related to what we want to do and reach out to people never right. shy away from reaching out to people contacting people contacting faculty members labs organizations they are always looking for young researchers uh, and gradually getting involved seeing that okay what aspect of two zero aspect zero of six zero be a part of. Uh, it sometimes can take years and hundreds of emails to find a spot that you like but it's also about persistence and continuing to do it and in between, if you find something else that you think is, oh, no, I won't actually do that, then also pursue right. that. Right, explore. So, yeah. yeah, explore your interests. So being curious, being persistent, and it is going to be frustrating. It will be not the smoothest journey always. Uh, mm. And But that's how it is. Yeah. And just carrying and on. And there's many different paths. Yeah, yeah. and also be, be practical about it, that uh, not... My we want we all you can come down a little now. I'm all of over us the, want to over the hump there. work in the best and the most constructive and learning work environments, but not necessarily we will get that always. Right. So how to uh, maneuver through those situations is, is also, also a thing to is learn. Is that a dumbo? I think dumbo. it is. Sorry to cut you yeah. off. No, <laughs> no. You're right. I see the ears. <laughs> <laughs> It is floating like a balloon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I gotta change our tally mark to seven. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm wearing my Dumbo octopus shirt today. <gasps> yes. That must be why. Wait. Right. Turn. Can I see? Yeah. It's from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Oh, awesome. I got it my I think my first year during my internship. Nope. Um, yeah. One wow. second. Let me mute so I can show you. <laughs> I see the tentacles. And it is slowly flapping its within coats ears. Uh -huh. so We've been very lucky to see this many. Right. What is that so uh, floating behind? Yeah. Some kind of jelly. Tina four. Oh, a Tina four. That's an awesome shot. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Two little floating, floating friends. <laughs> and there's a red Tina four. Can we turn well. the lasers off? <laughs> Lasers off, please. Yeah. Lasers good call. So we can get some good photos. Thank you. Roger, roger, roger. You're very welcome. <laughs> what a view. Yeah. Jacob, where are you? The Lasers beautiful got it. Got it. Oh, got it. Right. Swimming yeah. Down five, please. Yep. Small Down five. For bobbing yeah, by turn your auto heading now. Turning auto heading off. I think yeah. it's a birthday parade for <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a swimming octopod and a floating Tina for. Okay. Auto heading back on. Back on. We're going to pay for that. We are seriously downwind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the Thank wonderful Thank you, footage. yeah. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Sorry for uh, all right, gotta come the difficulties that no, will come, you can't come back from that. No, not at all. We oh, always... Oh, Canada, yeah, we're going to... Yeah, we yeah, are. Yeah. Pause for Sorry, we're going to take a minute to... We are. Get back in the box. Reiterate. Here. can put in another move. Um, zero four five, please. 
Yeah, it can come up a bit now. And we have seen some beautiful bamboo coral uh, colonies, and we have been continuing uh, to see some of them. Which way do you got to turn to take that half years. wrap out? You want to turn and put your tail into the breeze, whatever that is. So uh, you want to turn counter clock, I reckon. This side of the cliff is very sparse. I wonder why. Yeah, you can come back around to that zero four five heading. Yeah, but yeah, but don't go that way. <laughs> uh, if you do come up, come up tight, because. Yeah, I think I pulled you around. The well, I'm a bit concerned okay, about right. coming around that oh. way in the current, yeah, oh, yeah. especially oh, with that oh, tether yeah. bouncing like So come up a bit more, come up another five, and then you can try and come around the other way. Yes. All right. You can try. Try, try, try. I don't know if you'll be able to get around on this breeze. We can keep bumping it. Seems to be coming around. Yep, yep. Keep come on. Keep coming around clockwise. Okay. Beauty. Nicely done. Uh, yeah, you keep coming around, please. Yeah, please. Uh, to the northeast. To northeast. I'm just gonna jump off for a second for a classroom call setup. So I'll be back in a in a bit. Video is also Thank swapping you. for a classroom call. Thanks, Kara. Thanks, Jana. And what kind of Tina for was that? Was it a red dragon? Um, I think it was a low bit green you know, for let me check. Sorry, what? Dan was asking what kind of Tina four that was. If it was a red dragon. I don't know which ones are the red dragons. I'm horrible with common names, but I'm going to check and tell you which kind oh. it was. I I have a general idea, but I don't want to see the name before checking. Red. Right. Zero six zero one. Right up. Uh, come down for me, Tino. We're just getting back in the box here after a little octopus holiday. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's that? Right. Uh, you can come right down. That's it depends on how close I am. It wasn't even that long of an octopus holiday, but that's the strength of the current. Yeah, and Saris PL, if you've been talking to me, I've had you off most of the time, trying to concentrate. No, you're fine. Uh, it was definitely a tentaculata. Just absolutely ripping up over this little ridge here, like an animal strumming in the breeze. Yeah, it's working pretty hard. Both of them. Total ridge running though. See how fast it's going through the. Be interesting to. Uh, you knew how fight wide the wheel, field of view was to do uh, distance over time calc. Huh?
Alright, yeah. I think we're gonna take a candelabra holiday here. Yes. So these are the keratoisidin I four clayed uh, candelabra bamboo corals and they are currently being put into a new genus Tridentisis. But that paper hasn't yet been published. It's in I think it has been submitted or in review. So soon we sh will have a formal genus name for this. Uh, but since till that gets published, it uh, you can, uh, come down five there. The cat I said in the to another, uh, and to uh, and and uh, I think it's another just today that my advisor submitted the paper or one of the revisions of the paper for the genus. Uh, so you can zoom in, Jaina, please. Oh, sorry. Video, Amber. What's going I on? Snuck Why is everyone here. changing out in the middle <laughs> of my watch? Uh, kids on their internet. Wow, look at those polyps. Yeah, those are beautiful polyps. So this is a bamboo coral. Soon to be in the genus Tridentisis, but now the I4 cleared. I'm gonna look left just Thank uh, you. a couple degrees. Looks like the. I'm gonna play with the uh, Atalanta's heading here. Just to Looks like we ran out of ridge line. Talking to myself, sorry. You ready for me to go full wide? Uh, no, we can watch this for okay. a second here. Sure. Oh, you can see the pinules. You can see the pinules and you can see the nodes and the internodes uh, through the tissue. Uh, the nodes and internodes of the skeleton through the tissue. Mm, very cool. And just a note, I'm back here because uh, our amazing interns Jacob and Jaina are um, calling into the classrooms themselves. Everyone seems to be able to do all that's the different great. jobs on the ship so that's awesome and they're <laughs> calling into St. Joseph's School in Hawaii so shout out to those uh, students. Your pen left there a bit on the that's high great. The colony is at an odd angle. If it was a little more upright would have, we could have got so a better view of the branching the pattern. Last waypoint there top. on the screen. Uh, because these patterns uh, are very important to the okay. Okay, I see it. Uh yeah, okay. Uh zoom back in for me. Zoom back in a little for me. Please. Zoom in, please. Uh, that's good, good. And we have some great botryoidal texture there in the background. So um, that is just meaning grape-like for the Ooh. texture on the rock, yeah. Thanks right. so much for sharing that. All thanks to the geologists, I did not. <laughs> Have you been taking, uh, <laughs> you've been learning from Dr. Isotope recently? Uh, yeah, uh, Hannah actually told me that one. Oh, yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, I yes. love Hannah's passion for okay. geology so much. It's the way it yeah, they're both very okay. knowledgeable and very passionate about their field, so it just makes it really easy to learn from them. Yeah. Because it's so easy to learn from someone who's excited about something, you know? Yeah. And if uh, any of our listeners want to hear um, Hannah and uh, Val, or we They're refer to her as Dr. Isotope sometimes, but if you want to learn more from them, um, feel free to tune into the other watches where they can share a little bit more about um, these amazing landscapes we're looking at. Yeah, so Val is on the All 8 right. to 12 watch, and Hannah is on the 4 to 8 watch. Awesome, thanks. Oh, is this a yeah. um, sea pen? pen? 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just <laughs> sea pen queen. <laughs> Can we have a quick zoom on it, please? Absolutely. Thank you. So this would be a uh, penatula. You come down a bit for me, too. Come down five, please. Okay, I'm very good. Pause right. it there, please. Zoom in it. I would uh, feel quite confident in calling it the penatula phosphoria. Uh, we have collected. Uh, okay, I should. One, there's a little shrimp next yes, to it. Yes, yes, there's a nice yeah. shrimp. So, um, a little bit about sea pens. And so, there are two basic morphologies that we see. So, this, I'm going to draw on the screen to while I'm talking. So, this central part is the rachis, you which is the central axial structure. And this I'll goes I'll into the sediment to the west there, and to what the is east, called right. the peduncle. So, that continues. Now there are two basic morphologies we have. In one kind, we have the polyps di rising directly from the rachis. Okay. And the other kind of morphology, for example, the one that we are seeing here, we see they have secondary leaf-like extensions on which the polyps are arranged. Right. So the other sea pen that we collected last, yesterday or day before yesterday, that was a kind where the polyps were rising directly from the rachis. So previously, based on the presence or absence of leaves, they were divided into two suborders taxonomically, but genetic and genomic studies have shown that that's not true. This pattern, oh, okay. presence and absence of leaves, the presence of leaves have evolved multiple times in the history oh, of the sea pens. Very interesting. So I would be quite confident in calling this a penatula phosphoria. Uh, and we see them quite squishy in the water, but right. when they're collected and they're brought up, they are very hard and spiky really? wow. and spiky uh, sea pens and it is very difficult to, if you see just that sample, you wouldn't imagine that they can be this yeah, uh, fluffy squishy, and squishy exactly looking. in the water because they, it's all water, they can, they can become inflated with water. Gotcha. They so have like a water based skeleton or the hydrostatic. Um, yeah. So the, the skeleton is inside and it is calcium, car we can continue moving, sorry. Uh, but this, the flesh, in the flesh, they can yeah. bring in water right, and right. swell up. Right, right. So, yeah. and if it helps for our viewers at all, um, the rachis is what you're, you were saying, right? That central kind of, you, if you imagine it as a feather, it's a that central, um, that central line going down. That would be the rachis, and then um, it has those extensions to the side horizontally from a feather. Yeah. And then our other C pen doesn't even look like a feather at all right it looks more like a how would you describe that uh th yeah this c looks like very much like the typical feather they right, would right. look like a central axis with the polyps on them mm -hmm. and what is also interesting in the sea bends which is not the case for the others the other corals have skeletons and branches and the polyps rising from it right mm -hmm. the bamboo corals the chrysogorgias all the other uh, kinds of octocorals that we have been seeing but in sea bends actually the first polyp, the primary polyp for the colony when it's small, that polyp develops into the rachis. Wow. And then you have secondary polyps. So that's why I was using the term secondary polyps. And okay. I realized that I didn't explain why I was calling it okay. a secondary polyp. So the first does, polyp... Uh, can I jump in for just yes. a second? Yeah. Yes. Um, does this look like a uh, potential scoop oh. area? I was wondering that as well when we were zoomed in, but... I can't tell. To me, this looks very small. Like, it could just be um, Fine manganese particles. crust p p pebbles, maybe. But I'm not too sure. I'm not either. It looks pretty small. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I See think it might just fall through the mesh, honestly. And that's a synolacted sea cucumber. Yeah. Okay, let's try uh, 20, zero, 090, zero. we'll see what happens. I'm going to um, make up a little ground here.
But thank you, Pashana, for that fascinating uh, morphology lesson on yeah, the on the sea pens. I can see now why you study them. They're <laughs> very fascinating. No, the more I learn about them, the more it seems there seems to be to learn about them. So yeah. really interesting. And there's that behavior we saw from one of our earlier dives where we kind of got close and then the and sea they, pen retracted oh, yes, into that's the sediment. Just fascinating. That the was, withdrawal behavior. Yeah, that was so cool. Yeah, I would to like see. to be in the class, but I think I'll just audit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also I think the reason I, I mean, sea pens have been uh, understudied in uh, among the rest of the octocorals, I think, because they don't grow into the very dramatically big uh, fans and uh, and they can be easy to miss. So that's also was something that had drawn me towards this group. That okay, this is an understudied and under resolved group with this Claire such Huck. interesting behavior and patterns that has been going on in this uh, group of octocorals. And they don't look like the rest of the octocorals as well. And um, are there also shallow water sea pens? Yes. Oh. There are some uh, very oh. shallow water sea pens, including the Renilla, which are this oh, commonly called the thing sea it's just a right, right below the screen, I thought. Tito, it was can you come up, uh, suck it up tight, and I'm going to do a little tether management here. I managed to put a turn in it. Come right up into the red somewhere. Uh, oh, wait, never mind. I was looking at the wrong. Never mind. I was looking at the wrong number. I'm uh, not bothered about the 6 8 or up to Sorry. I saw the one there and panicked. I do too. We can uh, keep moving east. Yes, please. Try a 40, man. Yeah, right. I have a feeling it's going to be boring for a while because we're uh, now out of the, we seem to be in the current shadow. Right. Well, unless you like rocks. <laughs> the cool stuff is kind of up to our left. You can see there the red, uh, red band in the Atlanta sonar on the left there to the, uh, Kind of to the north of us, so we were going uh, northeast for so long, and then we uh, took that opportunity to boogie woogie across the little flat you see there on the on the high pack survey, and yep. um, we're gonna now climb. Uh, should get steep here to the to the east, in theory, according to the uh, bathymetry. Just manganese crust. I want to say this looks like low vape flow, but that may be inaccurate. That is going to be my guess. <laughs> so low bait is um, 
like uh, in between the medium fast, so sheet flows are the really fast lava flows, pillow flow are the slower one, and then low bait is kind of in between. Wow, awesome, yeah. Based on what I've heard. <laughs> yeah, for sure, that's, that's so cool. We're all learning together, right? Um, the geology, the biology. And thank you all for your comments about um, joining us and um, being able to explore and learn with us as well. We really appreciate them. Is the current okay to keep chat going or would you like to pause chat um, to concentrate? We're all good up here. Okay, thanks for letting us know. Thank you for asking. I think we're catching a lee here, aren't we, Dan? Yeah, we a bit are out totally. of the wind. Yeah. Or we're down below it. It's uh, uh, hard to hard to say. I think I kind of feel like we're down down below it. Um, Upashana, curious, are there sprinkle sensors all over the sea pens that sea you mount. can visit in shallow waters? Like if you're a diver, right? Can you, are there sea pens that you can see? Oh yeah, there are several sea, shallow water sea pens actually. Um, I can show you later, there are several genera that are mostly restricted to the shallow water. And uh, I think um, one common are the sea pansies they look like oh, the yeah, red flag yeah so they are solely uh, shallow waters we have mm -hmm. lots of cavernularias clavularias some me on my toes there dan <laughs> uh, i was just some vergularias there's lots of shallow water sea oh. are we seeing clouds of like amphipods or is that sediment that looks like sediment sediment yeah because Sorry. amphipods tend to swim a little bit. Yeah, I had seen a cloud earlier that looked more really? like it was swimming around, okay. but yeah, that looked like sediment. Have you seen clouds of amphipods before? Is that a thing? I have not. That's why I was <laughs> like, uh, does anyone else see this? <laughs> or are my eyes playing tricks? That would be very interesting if we did, like <laughs> if they were all feeding or mating or something. Um, and I believe sea pansies, you can see them on the beach sometimes, yeah, right? So you yeah. don't even have to dive, you can... They, um, inter they can be found in the intertidal zone. Wow, and apparently they're bioluminescent, so yes. they have green fluorescent protein, so that's super cool yeah. too. I have some yeah. fun theories about the uh, sea pansies, but I still haven't... I have tested it a little bit, but I need to confirm it yeah, two zero more. East. The problem is that I don't have great C uh tissue samples. I mm -hmm. have a few, but they're not working well because I think they weren't prob properly uh, preserved. And the museums didn't have a lot of uh, recent C pansies. Mm -hmm. If I get uh, some good tissue samples from C pansies, I have a theory. Uh, it's <laughs> so far, it seems true. But I need to confirm it a little bit more. Are you able to share the theory or it's top secret for now? <laughs> uh, it has got to do with the phylogenetic position of the sea pansies. Ah. Um, but, I mean, it, it's got, I have a theory about why they look that way. But, you know, I don't want to go ahead and see something before testing it completely. Yeah, right. and then <laughs> oh, Yeah, another bit of stuff falling off of the <laughs> voltage sponge. Every time I see a Voltaire sponge, that just makes me think like me on most days in the lab. Like it needs like somebody needs to sit down and comb it, extend like hairs, and make nice ponytails out of it. I think seeing the brittle stars jump off of things is one of my favorite observations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't even jump off. I think they just let go. No, I mean, yeah. But like, it's I'm fun. Done. It's so much fun. It's got to be recreational. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this 
sea bitch. Recreational deep sea diving. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's one. Ooh. You can do it. <laughs> Polishing the uh, spills camera there. <laughs> oh, is that a swimming? Um, Crinoid. Oh, I didn't realize they swam. Yeah, they swim. And they look. <laughs> they fun. look so. Uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> There's a lot of movement happening. Yeah. Uh, pushing there, Amber. I'm just going to let the ship catch up for another minute here so I can do it around a bit. I wonder how long it will take them to crawl back up. And we have some hydroids growing on the sponge as well. There's another one thinking about jumping. <laughs> oh, it's next. <laughs> In line. At this point, I feel like you're like reading their minds, Mia. Like you, you've yeah. been the sea star spotter. Now you're the brittle star the mind reader. <laughs> sea star whisperer. Yeah. I mean, I've only had SP on for like two minutes. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just happened to be when we got here. Yeah, crinoids are really fascinating organisms, and uh, I, I mean, I would say one of my favorite groups of organisms would be okay. the crinoids. And very different in the huge diversity that we see, and so yeah, th and that's very interesting. Right. And one of the, uh, not I would say the prominent researcher in the field of crinoid biology. Uh, Dr. Chuck Messing unfortunately passed away uh, very recently. I got to know about it yesterday, and he was, I, he, his body of work is huge. And uh, I, even though I was introduced uh, to his work just I think in 2017, and he was one of the uh, lead scientists on one of the Okeanos expeditions, and I was working on that. And his commentary is probably one of the best that I have heard to We're the date, and right he up here explained things so wonderfully and in such an entertaining way. And then I have gone on to hear lots of stories about him from my advisor. He then sent us a lots of coral specimen ones, and I've always, I'd always wanted to meet him and work with him, but like yeah, just yesterday I got to know he passed away very recently, and that's a big loss for the whole uh, deep sea yeah. community. May he rest in peace. Yeah. yeah. What was his name again? Chuck Messing, Charles Messing. Thank you. Yeah, I Chuck was down just a bit. Yeah. I'll have to definitely look into yeah. his, his contributions. Yeah. That's another Rhodanerida Gorgia. And just jumping in real quick, if um, any viewers are unfamiliar with what a crinoid is, they're also commonly called sea lilies or feather stars. They're relatives of sea stars, um, and they look super like a lily or um, basically a batch of feathers all connected to a point, and they can swim. I th believe I saw one video of them, one like yeah, crawling on the sea floor before, so that was crazy. And some of them just stay on their stock as well, so um, definitely interesting creature if you want to learn more about them. I think we've been seeing some of the more pillowy looking forms amongst all of this, you know, low bait sheet flow. So slower extrusions. At least they look like we saw a few of them. Mm. Yeah, thanks Hans. From 12 to 4, Hans is our geologist. No, 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 <laughs> I no. I think no, that's no, you no, now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say in Hans, geologist. Is that a sea star right there? Yeah. Is it holding on to something? Is it on top? Oh. Yeah, I think it is on top. Push in there for the... I don't think it's on anything. It's just is that a jumble of sea stars? Doing yoga. Is it okay to push in, right? South. West. Okay. Hmm. I think there's something on the lens of the, the still cam. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. But that looks like... I wish I... Oh, maybe there is a little coral under there. I wish I felt as chill as that starfish looks. Sea star looks. <laughs> It's like looking at a dog that's all cur okay, curled up, thinks. cozy. Yeah. We had that other one that looked like a sloth the other day, hanging off the coral. Yeah. When my dogs go on the lay on their backs, it's not curled up, they're a full stretch. Aww. <laughs> My favorite is the splute, you know, when they like lie on their tummies and then like completely show all of their paws. Yeah, that's the term <laughs> for it, splute. <laughs> Spluting. Spluting. Good for another 20. Yes, please. Is that a rock pen there? No. Oh. Sorry, bear. <laughs> it just went off the screen. I don't. Oh. I Where don't know what it was. Notes. Where did you see it? Sorry, I missed it. Um, bottom left hand, just a bottom little left. bit off screen. It should arrive in the center. That thing? No, it was like oh, a yeah, yeah, there it is. There it is. Oh, yeah, good eye. Thank you. Oh, That's a really good rock spot. pen. Right? This is a rock yes, pen? Yes, yes. So this is a sea pen. Okay, I'm very precious. A very precious one. And uh, here you can see that the... Um, polyps are rising directly from the central axis and the speciality of this kind of a C pen is that uh, the peduncle <laughs> this is the peduncle I was gonna say is it a peduncle it <laughs> is a true peduncle but here it has been modified into a suction cup or a, a suction cup like structure that allows it to uh, attach onto the uh, hard rocky substrate uh, whereas in all the other sea pens, this peduncle gets inflated with water and uh, remains uh, inside the sediment to attach the colony. So this is a very special kind of modification that we see in a group of sea pens. Uh, they're currently in the genus Anthotylum and one of my uh, PhD works is on this group of sea pens. And uh, yeah, they are very cool, very interesting. We s there are currently four species uh, described. Uh, there, there is some degree of morphological variability among these rock bands, uh, but yes, there is more to that story, and we'll know more <laughs> soon. Wow. I'm still waiting for a couple of samples.